I assume most of you know Olson Zaltman. We're a consumer insights firm founded by Jerry Olson from Penn State University and Gerald Zaltman from Harvard Business School. We help clients understand the mind of the market, the things deep in our psyche that we don't even know we know. And of course, memory is a big part of that. Today, we'll be talking about why memories are so elusive and what the implications are of that for market research. I have the chat feature turned off right now. However, if you have questions as I am talking, please make note of those. With about five minutes left in the webinar, I'll open up the chat room and you can enter your questions there. And then toward the end, I will do my best to answer those questions. So with that, let's begin our journey into the dark underworld of the human memory. During the 2012 presidential campaign, Texas Governor Rick Perry had emerged as the leading contender for the Republican nomination. He headed into the debates with a big lead. All the wind was at his back. And then, all of a sudden, at the first debate, this happened. It's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the, um, uh, what's the third one there? Let's see. <laughs> EPA? EPA, there you go. No, okay. Let's talk, let's talk deposition. Seriously? Um, Is EPA no, the one you were talking about? Or? No, sir. You that. can't name the third one? The third agency of government, yeah. I, would, I would do away with the education, uh, the uh, <laughs> I, I, commerce, and let's see. I can't. The third one, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> Oops. Oops, indeed. You listen to that and you, you just, you're in pain for this guy. It's so awkward and it's so uncomfortable. But think about this. How many times do you think Rick Perry had thought about that particular element of his domestic policy? It's probably something that he had thought about and even rehearsed hundreds of times. So you listen to him stumble like this and you say to yourself, man, how could this possibly happen? This is Yo-Yo Ma, and this also is Yo-Yo Ma's cello. It's a Stradivarius, valued at about two and a half million dollars. A few years ago, Yo-Yo Ma was doing a performance at Carnegie Hall in New York, and as usual, it was a bravura performance. He got a standing ovation. He hung around backstage afterwards and met all his fans. It was a long night. So at the end of the night, he walks out of the of Carnegie Hall and someone hails him a cab. He puts his cello in the back of the cab and he rides back to his hotel. Gets to the hotel, gets out of his car, walks through the lobby, goes up to his room, brushes his teeth, jumps into his jammies, tucks himself into bed. And suddenly, like a lightning bolt, he is startled out of bed with one thought. I just left my two and a half million dollar Stradivarius in the trunk of a dirty, disgusting New York City taxi cab. He calls hotel security, security calls the police, the police call the cab company. Eventually the cab driver gets back together with Yo-Yo Ma, gives him back his two and a half million dollar cello and all's well that ends well. But nevertheless, something like this happens and you ask yourself, good Lord, how could this possibly happen to somebody? But here's the thing about this. We're a lot more like Rick Perry and Yo-Yo Ma than we might like to believe. Our memories simply are not very reliable. And I'd like to prove that to you, if you could give me a moment. What I'd like you to do, first of all, is if you have an Apple product, I'd like you to put it on the floor or put it out of sight. Now, I realize some of you are probably watching this very webinar on an Apple product. So if you could, at the very least, maybe cover up the, the Apple logo on that particular device. And now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a, a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper, and I would like you to draw from memory the Apple logo. And I'll give you about 15 or 20 seconds to do that. Okay, how's it coming along? You have at least a, a rough idea sketched out there on paper? 
This was a study that was done at UCLA. Uh, UCLA researchers asked 55 people to draw from memory the Apple logo. And more than half of these subjects were Apple users, meaning that they had seen this logo probably, if you stop and think about it, thousands of times over the course of their lives. Even the people who didn't own Apples, think about how many times we probably see that logo. Even if you don't own an Apple device, you probably see that logo somewhere a couple of times a day. At any rate, people drew the logo and then were asked to rate how confident they were in their accuracy. So how confident are you that you drew that logo correctly on a scale of one to 10? Well, in the UCLA study, the average confidence level was around eight. So almost everybody thought they had it right. Out of the 55 people who were part of this study, 54 of them got it wrong. Later, another group of subjects was shown the grid of the logos that you see right here. And they were asked to select the correct Apple logo from the ones that were in front of them. And again, asked to rate how confident they were in their selection. Again, almost everyone was confident that they had it correctly, uh, correctly identified. Uh, did you pick this one? If you did, you got it wrong too, because it's the one at the top in the middle. And again, in that study, even when people were looking at the logos, about half the people in the study got it wrong. The point is, we like to think that our memories are like this, like a picture, like a photograph, something that we can recollect pixel by pixel and bring the past back to life exactly as it was. However, in reality, our memories are much more like this, like clay that can be molded and shaped. Sometimes little pieces of it drop to the floor, never to be seen again. The point is memory is reconstructive. It is not reproductive. Every time we call up a memory from the past, we change it slightly. And that is why memory is so tricky. And it's at the core of what we're going to be talking about today. This presentation is based on a book by a noted memory researcher from Harvard's Department of Psychology by the name of Daniel Schachter. He wrote a book about 20 years ago called The Seven Sins of Memory. Great book, highly recommend that you check it out if you are, are more intrigued by memory at the end of this webinar. There are, as the title suggests, seven sins that he talks about. Not all of those sins are directly relevant to market research. So today, what we'll do is focus on four of those seven sins and what they mean for those of us in the field of marketing and marketing research. But before we delve into the sins specifically, a small aside, I wanna define first the different kinds of memories that exist. Memory is divided into three categories. The first category of memory is called procedural memory. This is the memory for how to conduct a particular task. And these memories tend to be quite stable over time. They become cemented in our minds very easily. So for instance, if, this, if, if we were coming up on Thanksgiving and this is only the second time I've ever cooked a Thanksgiving turkey, I might struggle to remember a little bit how to do it. But on the other hand, if this is the 25th consecutive year that I've cooked the Thanksgiving turkey, I'm not gonna need to open up a cookbook and relearn the task. Just like we never forget how to ride a bike, or we never forget how to walk, or we never forget how to drive a car, we have a very good way of holding on to these procedural memories. Even people who are stricken with amnesia typically retain a good bit of their procedural memory. The second form of memory is called semantic memory. This is our memory for general facts, such as what do people eat on Thanksgiving? This form of memory is highly variable depending on how often a piece of information gets repeated and how relevant that piece of information is to you. So for example, what people eat on Thanksgiving is highly relevant. We hear about that every year. We partake in that activity every year. So we remember it quite well. Uh, on the other hand, probably at some point during our education uh, years ago in school, we probably learned the name of the 13th president of the United States. And there's a very good chance we've forgotten that because Millard Fillmore is not particularly relevant to most of us as we go through our daily lives. 
So semantic memory is highly variable, can be very permanent, can also be very elusive. The third form of memory is called episodic memory. Things like, what did I do on Thanksgiving in 2006? What did you do on Thanksgiving in 2006? I'll bet you probably can't remember it too well because episodic memories can be very difficult to hold on to for any length of time, and they can be extremely unreliable. However, in market research, we rely a lot on episodic memory. We often expect consumers to rely on their episodic memories by talking about what this particular time you use this particular product or the decision process you went through two years ago when you decided on that particular brand. Episodic memories are very elusive and they're very important to us. So we're gonna talk about now why those kinds of memories are so elusive and later what we can do about it. And this is where the sins come in. The first sin that we're going to talk about is what Schachter called the sin of transience. And we abbreviate that with a little catchy slogan called details mix as the clock ticks. So imagine that I asked you what you did at work yesterday. I'm thinking you could probably describe that in some detail. That memory is probably quite fresh. On the other hand, now imagine that I asked you to describe what you did at work two weeks from today or two weeks ago. You'd probably struggle to recall that in any detail at all. You could probably tell me generally what you did. You drove into the parking lot, you poured yourself a coffee, you checked your email, you went to some meetings, the general stuff. But the specifics, by and large, are probably gone. And this is because as time goes by and we have more and more similar experiences, the details of past experiences tend to all kind of blur together into a giant mush and eventually fade away. Now, there are exceptions to this. If your last day at the office before a long vacation occurred two weeks ago, and this is your first day back, then you probably could tell me a few details about what you did that day because there have been no intervening similar experiences. Or on the other hand, if something really remarkable happened on that day, uh, you might remember that. But even in that case, your memory might not be as reliable as you think it is. Even those so-called flashbulb memories, which is uh, when you remember where you were on 9-11 or where you were, if you're old enough, when the space shuttle Challenger exploded or where you were when JFK was assassinated, even those sorts of flashbulb memories are much less reliable than we tend to think they are. Another aspect of the sin of transience is that there are two selves that exist within us. There is the experiencing self and there is the remembering self. This was a study conducted by Daniel Kahneman, who I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, this was a study conducted in the year 2000. And in this study, men were undergoing colonoscopies and they were asked to rate their level of pain on a scale of one to 10 at one minute intervals. Now this was conducted, as I say, about 20 years ago. Uh, now colonoscopies are really not that arduous of a procedure, but back then they were quite uncomfortable. So you can ask a question about these two patients that you see on the screen and how they rated their pain over time. You can ask, how much do these patients suffer? That's a very clear question and it yields a very clear answer. Clearly, patient B had more suffering than patient A. His colonoscopy went on for more than twice as long, almost three times as long as patient A's colonoscopy, and his peaks of pain were more intense and more numerous. On the other hand, you can ask a different question, which is, how much do these patients think they suffered? That is a very different question that yields a very different answer. Patient A, remembered that experience to be much more painful than patient B did. Memories are stories that we tell ourselves. And one of the most important parts of a story is how it ends. Patient A's procedure ended with a spike of intense pain. Patient B's procedure ended with the intensity of pain clearly on the decline and pretty far from its peak. 
And therefore, patient A, because his experience ended so badly, remembered that experience much worse than patient B. Now, you could change these results, which researchers actually did. It's a little sadistic, but you could do it. You could leave the tube inside of patient A for a few more minutes, maybe wiggle it around a little bit, not too much, but just a little bit, just to cause a little bit of discomfort. Make patient A suffer just a little bit more, but not very much. That will dramatically alter patient A's memory of how he experienced the overall procedure. It won't seem nearly as bad in retrospect. So by doing that, you've made patient A's experiencing self slightly worse off, but you have made his remembering self much better off. The first sin, the sin of transience. Details mix as the clock ticks. Our second sin is the sin of suggestibility which we notate with, a nudge can make you fudge. Suggestibility, by the way, doesn't necessarily mean that someone is trying to intentionally mislead you. The words that we use quite innocently can alter how people remember an experience. In this study by Elizabeth Loftus, who is a noted memory researcher, people were shown video of a simulated car accident and then they were asked some questions. One group was asked to describe what happens when the car, or what happened when the cars hit each other. Another group was asked to describe what happened when the cars smashed into each other. As it happens, the people who were asked about the cars smashing into each other were much more likely to say that they remembered seeing broken glass. And this is true whether or not there was broken glass in the video. They were also much more likely to infer that they were injuries. They were much more likely to assume that at least one of the cars was traveling at a high rate of speed. This is because the word smashed activates a different set of meaning in our mind than the word hit, a set of meaning that is associated with speed, that is associated with something uh, catastrophic, that is associated with injuries and damage. Just the transposition of that one word can completely change how people remember seeing an experience. And believe it or not, this can be true even among people who are trained to be observant and hyper aware of their surroundings. Even those kinds of people can misremember important details under the right circumstances. The US military conducted a training exercise to help soldiers understand what it would be like to be taken hostage as a prisoner of war. And these soldiers were subjected to 30 minutes of aggressive, hostile, and physically abusive interrogation. And afterwards, the soldiers were debriefed about their experience by an officer. And at the end of that debrief, they were asked to pick their interrogator out of a lineup and just by the words that the officer used and the way he or she framed certain questions, these trainees could be easily led to misidentify that interrogator and choose an innocent person who bore very little resemblance to the man who is actually roughing them up. The soldiers could be induced to say that the interrogator was wearing a uniform when in fact he was not. They could be induced to say that the interrogator was carrying a gun when in fact he was not. This has real life ramifications. In the last decade or more, we've seen dozens, uh, if not hundreds of people released from prison who were convicted almost solely on the basis of eyewitness testimony. And we see from this how unreliable eyewitness testimony can be. So this sin has implications that go far beyond lab experiments and far beyond marketing and far beyond market research. The ignorance of this sin has the potential to destroy lives. The sin of suggestibility, a nudge can make you fudge. The third sin that we will discuss is the sin of bias. Today shapes yesterday. Northwestern University, great university, there's a good chance some of you listening to this webinar have attended that university. Athletics is not something they are generally known for. Before three important games of the 1995 college football season, Northwestern fans were asked 
to predict the likelihood of their team winning the upcoming football game. Researchers asked a couple hundred fans on Friday how likely it was that Northwestern would win. And as it turns out, that year, Northwestern, which was usually a just historically awful football team, they were really good that year, and they won all three of those games. Then on the Monday after each game, a couple hundred other fans were asked to remember what they thought would happen in Saturday's game. The people who were asked to remember what they thought would happen were much more likely to say that they thought Northwestern would win compared to the people who actually were forced to go out on a limb and predict what would happen. Why is this? This is the I knew it all along syndrome. Those of us in research have all had this experience. We do a presentation or we do research for a client. We go to the client. We present what we think is just groundbreaking new insight. And the client says, ah, we've heard this all before. I knew that. Maybe they did or maybe they didn't. It could be this I knew it all along syndrome. People are always trying to unconsciously manage cognitive dissonance, which is the discomfort that results from conflicting thoughts and conflicting emotions. So that can shape how we think that we thought about things in the past. Similarly, young couples were asked to rate the quality of their romantic relationship. And they were asked to do so at two points in time, once in February and once in October. But in October, they were also asked to remember how they had rated their relationship back in February. And when those people were asked to remember how they rated their relationship in February, they made errors. And they made those errors in a very systematic way. They unconsciously adjusted their memory of February's rating to be more in line with October's rating. In other words, if their relationship was better in October, they adjusted their memory of, Friday, of uh, February's rating to be higher than it actually was. On the other hand, if the relationship had deteriorated, they adjusted their memory of February's rating to be lower than it actually was. You can see this in advertising research too. You can take a group of people who slightly prefer brand A, then you bombard them with messages about how brand B is better. And within a few weeks, they'll sit back and they'll tell you that they preferred brand B all along. And this is something we also see uh, in the context of how we think about our body. So for instance, if we're in pain right now, we're likely to remember past experiences of pain as being much worse than when we're not in pain and ask for those recollections. So imagine I asked you to think right now, you know, what's it like to have a cold? You probably say, yeah, it's, you know, it's not great, but you're over it in a couple of days, no big deal. But if you are right now in the midst of a cold, you probably feel like you're dying. You're absolutely miserable. So the, again, it's that sin of bias. What is happening today shapes how we remember uh, yesterday. And finally, our fourth sin is what we call the sin of misattribution, our eyes lies. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you about uh, 10, 15, 20 seconds or so to read this list of words to yourself silently. So now what I'm going to do is when they, when they typically do studies like this, they include a, a distraction task and I don't have the benefit of audio. So I'll just, I'll, I'll show some funny cameras and get you thinking about something else, like something else like a cat plunging a toilet. Look at that, how cool is that? And look at this, a cute baby picture. A cat, what the hell is this? What is going on? Is cat flying through the air? Look at this, there's a kid boxing his dog. What is happening? Hey, there's another cat looking crazy. How creepy and weird is that? Now that you're laughing and you're totally distracted, I'm going to put these words up on the screen, and I would like you to recall which of these words were on that list. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Here is the answer. I'm guessing you got at least one of those wrong. 70 to 80% of people will make at least one error on tests like this. Why is that? Because in our memory, 
we fill in the gaps and we kind of get a gestalt idea of things. And then we use our mind to retroactively fill in the white spaces. So the word needle was not on that list. The word thread was, pin was, eye was, sewing was, sharp was, point was, prick was, thimble was, a lot of words related to needle, but the actual word needle was not on there. So we get this gestalt idea in our mind, and then when we are asked to try to remember it, we make mistakes. Uh, we're not quite accurate because our mind often fills in gaps that are not there. It's misattribution. This is a very cool study, a funny study that illustrates the same point. Uh, a colleague of mine, Catherine Latour, not a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, Catherine Latour at Cornell, uh, did this study some years ago where um, she recruited people who had gone to Disney World as children. And she showed them a mock ad that depicted Bugs Bunny hugging children at Disney World. And later, they were asked about their memories of meeting bugs as a child at Disney World. So about 30% of people said they remembered meeting Bugs Bunny at Disney World. And a lot of those people created very elaborate, sometimes uh, uh, poignant, tear-jerking stories about their experience at Disney World and Bugs Bunny coming up and giving them a hug and posing for pictures with their family. There's a problem here that you may have picked up on. Bugs Bunny is a Warner Brothers character. He's not a Disney character. He has never appeared at Disney World. He never will appear at Disney World. Now this has implications for advertising. Vacations, for example, are largely post-consumptive experiences. So how we remember a vacation is just as important as how we experienced it. So we might go on vacation to uh, an island somewhere and it might be miserable. We might be getting bit by mosquitoes. It might be ridiculously warm, but in our memory, we might think back uh, to the fun we had with our family. And so the mosquitoes and the unbearable heat kind of go away. Um, it's also a problem in advertising. It helps to explain why similar types of advertising tend to run together uh, in the consumer's minds. Um, and also the more consistent a quote unquote lie is, the more likely someone is to fall prey to misattribution. So if people were asked to remember interacting with aliens at Disney World rather than Bugs Bunny, it's, it, nobody would have remembered that. Uh, but Bugs Bunny is a cartoon character. There are cartoon characters at Disney World. It's not that far out of the realm of possibility. Also, the more credible the source, the more likely someone is to fall prey to misattribution. A police officer or a doctor, for example, uh, is more likely to accidentally invite misattribution than a teenager who's wearing a clown costume. So the four sins, the sin of transience, details mix as the clock ticks, the sin of suggestibility, a nudge can make you fudge. The sin of bias, today shapes yesterday, and finally, the sin of misattribution, our eyes lies. Now, none of this is to say that our memories are entirely wrong. It's not as if humans go around in a constant fugue state, just not remembering anything that ever happened to them. Um, our memories are correct a lot. The problem is they're less correct than we think they are. And we don't know when they're correct and when they're not. That's where you run into trouble. So. If you're a marketer or a researcher, what do you do about this, knowing that our memories are flawed as they are? Uh, and with that, I will open the uh, chat window uh, and I'll invite some questions uh, for you or invite you to ask some questions and uh, we'll answer them at the end. But I want to cover first, uh, the chat window is open if you'd like to type in some questions. First, I'll talk about though, before I answer those questions, what to do about these sins of memory if you are in marketing or in market research. One thing you can do is make the most of it. Sometimes it really doesn't matter if someone misremembers the details of an experience. You can let those sins sort of work to your advantage. In fact, in some ways, it can be instructive for a brand to understand the ways in which people do misremember an experience. Um, for example, in the UK, uh, Pizza Hut interviewed customers uh, as they left the restaurant. And then they followed up a week later 
to ask again about that experience. And what they found was that not only did many customers forget some of the high points of their visit, but they also invented negative details that were not part of their original account. They would talk about things like long waits or dirty tables, even though they never remembered that uh, in real time. So what Pizza Hut did was they used those insights in the UK to make memories of the positive aspects of that restaurant visit. And they tried to make, therefore, that visit more sticky. Uh, for example, as people left the restaurant, they uh, organized the restaurant in, in ways that made people remember that exit. Uh, they added lighting at certain parts of the restaurant to, uh, to highlight certain positive aspects of the food. And the results were tremendous. Uh, in a handful of pilot restaurants, those results were overwhelmingly favorable for Pizza Hut. And uh, they're in the process of uh, making those sorts of changes to all their restaurants in the UK. So sometimes those sins uh, or that sin of misremembering uh, doesn't really matter. It can be good to know how people misremember things. Another thing to do if you are a researcher is to be selective with surveys. Surveys are really useful for getting answers to relatively straightforward questions that do not require a whole lot of intense reflection. So for instance, uh, if the election were today, for whom would you vote? Uh, survey is great for that or a poll. Uh, what brands come to mind when you think about pasta sauce? How long is your morning commute? Those are things that don't really require a lot of intense unconscious reflection, and we can answer those things pretty accurately. But what we tend to do much less well is to paint an unbiased retroactive portrait of what a consumer was thinking or feeling or doing at a specific point in time. Uh, as we've seen, humans tend to reconstruct the past based on what they know about the present, but researchers often underestimate how dramatic that reconstruction be, uh, can be. So consumers will answer questions about what they were thinking back then, but we should never take those answers as gospel truth. Um, for instance, we did a, a study for a, a client in the food and beverage industry, and they have a very unique packaging. Uh, the package is, is kind of plain, but nevertheless, it stands out to people. And prior to this, our client had done a lot of surveys to try to understand what is it about this package that sticks out to people. Uh, and all they could really get from those surveys was the package sticks out to people. Nobody could really tell you why. But what we found when we were doing uh, some deeper research uh, is that we found that uh, why it stands out to people. And people talked about the context of their lives. They said, you know, a lot of times in life, you have to put on a front, you have to wear a mask just to get through the day and to deal with people and all the nonsense that you got to deal with at work and things like that. But consuming this particular product, when I come home from work, helps me shed that mask. And that very plain, almost boring packaging is a symbol of that. Uh, and it, 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 it is a symbol for just being myself and being real and being true uh, to who I am. Similarly, if you're doing a, a quantitative research, it's important to provide context. So rather than asking people, how often do you consume product X, frame that up in some contextual way. So how often do you consume product X during a typical night of TV viewing? Or how often do you consume product X during a typical weekend breakfast? A third thing you can do is be wise with your words. As uh, Elizabeth Loftus learned in her prisoner of war simulation that we talked about earlier, <clears throat> and in her car accident simulation, very subtle cues like the words we use when crafting our questions can unconsciously alter how people remember an event. And even the order in which questions are posed can sometimes scramble people's recollections. So therefore, it's important for researchers to take special care to avoid leading questions. And a lot of times that's easier said than done. We've all fallen prey to it. We've all sat in the back room and listened to other researchers ask leading questions and we've cringed. And then we do the same thing ourselves. It's uh, not easy to, to avoid uh, all the time. So as a shortcut, if a respondent can answer a question with a yes or no, you're probably asking a leading question. If you preface a question with, in other words, it sounds like you're saying, uh, you're definitely leading them. Uh, a better approach would be to probe respondents with more open-ended questions in neutral language. So in other words, rather than asking, 
Uh, what problems did you experience during your stay at the Bedbug Inn? You might be better advised to ask, can you tell me more about your experience at the Bedbug Inn? Another technique that uh, at our company we often, we always train researchers to do is to incorporate respondents' own language in your follow-up probe. So you're doing a research project for the Bedbug Inn and a, a very happy guest tells you, my stay at the Bedbug Inn was like a night in heaven. It would be valuable to follow up with a question like, what happened that made your stay like a night in heaven? Uh, in other words, just be mindful about going where consumers take you rather than taking them where you want to go. Um, and similarly along this vein that uh, how you ask is important as what you ask, we did a, some research some years ago now about convenience stores where people buy food and we wanted to understand that experience. Uh, so we asked people, asked these men, and they were young men generally who tend to buy food at gas station convenience stores, um, tell me your thoughts and feelings about shopping for food at a gas station convenience store. And that's part of our methodology. We phrase, frame a broad question like that and we ask people to bring in pictures that represent symbolically their thoughts and feelings about that experience. So we just asked them, tell me your thoughts and feelings about sh shopping for food at a convenience store. And we did a couple of pilot interviews and the interviews were just, they were, they were horrendous. I mean, they were just terrible because people, it's something that people do habitually on a daily basis. So asking people to remember the details of something they do habitually on a daily basis is not very useful because of the sin of transience. All those memories sort of mush together. So we rethought it and we reframed the question. We said, next time you go to a gas station convenience store, take some time and carefully reflect on what you're experiencing. What do you see? What do you smell? What is going through your mind? Why are you there? And then with that in mind, Please bring in pictures that represent your thoughts and feelings at a gas station about shopping for food at a gas station convenience store. We reframed the question. We provided some context. We helped get around the sin of transience just by the way that we, we framed that question on our second try. And then finally, a fourth thing that you can do is to just sidestep the sins. So a surefire strategy for overcoming the sins of memory is to stop relying on memory. That fantasy world ideal, of course, would be to mind meld with the consumer and literally get into their head at the moment of the purchase decision. But despite what some neuromarketers might have us believe, that's still not possible. And it may never be. So we have to seek out some next best approaches. Uh, there are old school methodologies for doing this, like shop alongs, observational research and diaries. Uh, they can help us detour that murky underworld of memory and get us at least a couple steps closer to what a consumer is thinking or doing in the moment. All those methodologies have their shortcomings, but at least they can generate some hypotheses about what is driving consumer behavior and purchase. Um, in some areas, technology can track our behavior. So uh, if you wanna know about my exercise patterns, you can ask me that and I'll probably lie to you. Uh, or you can ask me to look at my Fitbit, ask to look at my Fitbit or my Apple Watch, and that can give you, that can give you a more, give a more, more accurate how I have been exercising over the past week. Uh, there are tools like experience sampling where you're sent text messages that can capture your thoughts and feelings and behaviors in real time. So for instance, if I wanted to track your daily water consumption, rather than asking you to estimate that from memory or even tally it at the end of the day, I could send you a text every 60 minutes and say, how many bottles of water have you consumed in the last half hour? Or if I wanted to understand uh, a patient's journey with depression. I could text that patient at specific intervals and say, how are you feeling right now? So experience sampling relies a lot on self-reporting and the data often lacks some context and richness, but the methodology does largely sidestep the sins of memory and can produce a significant number of data points for analysis. Um, and also implicit testing and deep dive interviews, they can't be conducted in the moment but they can reveal the unconscious meanings that lead a consumer to select one brand or one product over another. So if you're talking to a shopper who's purchased the same brand of detergent for 20 years, what went through her mind as she entered the laundry aisle is nearly irrelevant. It's an automatic habitual purchase. So she's more likely to be thinking about her daughter's soccer game or last night's Game of Thrones than anything to do specifically with detergent. So in a case like that, it might be more valuable to understand what people don't know they know, the implicit meanings that consumers attach to a brand or the deep emotional relevance of a particular category in a consumer's life. So in other words, you might find it more insightful to explore consumer psychology rather than purely consumer memory. 
If this webinar has uh, sparked your thinking a little bit, I have a couple of books to recommend to you, one of which I already did, The Seven Sins of Memory by Daniel Schachter. It's, uh, even though it's written by a Harvard professor, it's very highly readable uh, and not that long uh, and really compelling and interesting. Um, also, from the Psych 101 series, Memory 101 by James Lampinen and Denise Feike. Do not let the title deceive you. It sounds very elementary, but it's ex actually extremely insightful about how memory works. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, you can use it to think about implications for market research. So with that, we will transition to some q and I see some of you have posted uh, some questions uh, in the chat room. Uh, one is so insightful, James, although I knew it all along. I, I, I oughta, uh, let's go to some other questions. Are there ways to remember things more clearly given our fallibility in this area? I think I've touched on a couple of those. Um, the ways to remember things are, I mean, first of all, if you're primed to remember things, you probably will. So in that gas station convenience store study, we primed people, basically we're begging people, please remember this, <laughs> please think about this the next time you go to the store. And uh, as a result, they did. So you can take people out of that automatic reflexive mode and make them get more in the moment and therefore think a little bit more deeply about an experience. Or you can just not ask them to remember at all. Like I said, toward the end, you can sort of track people's behavior in real time uh, so that you can avoid uh, the problems that, that we have when we try to remember things uh, spontaneously. There is also a comment, uh, repetition converts false information into truth. That is indeed true in and of itself. Um, that can happen um, because we can forget the source of false information. And when you forget the source of false information and it's when it's repeated over and over again, we can come to accept it as truth. On the other hand, if you're a more of a glass half full person, uh, you can also think that uh, repetition can make good ideas stick in our head. So we might be initially resistant to uh, a really good idea, but the more it gets repeated, uh, the more that our, our our defenses come down and the more it kind of unconsciously uh, plants itself uh, in our mind. Uh, another question, what implication does this have for word of mouth? For example, uh, should we get recommendations as soon as possible after a good experience? Uh, yes, that probably would be um, a good idea because as we saw in that UK study uh, of Pizza Hut, uh, a lot of times the frames that we have for a particular experience will take over as time passes, especially if it's an experience that we're somewhat accustomed to and we think we know what to expect. So at Pizza Hut, when we they talked to people right after the experience, people said the experience was great. And then a week later, they said, yeah, the experience wasn't so great at all. So yeah, I think uh, if in an ideal world, if you could get those recommendations as soon as possible after the experience, uh, you'd be able to get a lot more detail through that, uh, through that uh, word of mouth recommendation and also probably get a more accurate uh, depiction of, um, of, of what that experience was like. Um, there's another question from uh, a gentleman who we worked with uh, about uh, orange juice and asking if I, if I remember the way people portrayed orange juice in people's lives. I do. That was a fascinating study where uh, we were working with the Florida Department of Citrus to understand the role of orange juice in people's lives. And, you know, these were adults, people in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and they could still hearken back to very fond and sometimes very detailed pictures of drinking orange juice as a child and all the emotional comfort that orange juice gave them. It almost like it was like it was back. They were back at the breakfast table and they were eight years old again and their parents were, were still alive. Now, were those memories all 100 percent accurate? Who knows? Maybe they didn't drink orange juice very often as a child. Maybe they only had it once or twice. But for some reason in their mind, it came to seem like uh, more of a routine event. That would not surprise me at all. Uh, but it's also in a way irrelevant because we weren't trying to get a, a, a veridical measure of how often they drank orange juice. We we're trying to understand what the mem what, how they remembered drinking orange juice and how they remembered was uh, highly positive and uh, highly detailed. Um, how do these three types of memories and sins relate to sensory memory, short-term 
uh, and long-term memory. Um, I'll in interpret that question the way I think it's intended. So um, the more there's research that shows that the more you can link senses to an event, the more sticky that event becomes in your mind. So in other words, a multi-sensory experience will help you remember that experience. So it's why, you know, for instance, uh, if we've been to the beach, most of us have, we can remember that probably to some great level of detail uh, because there's a lot of sensory cues associated with that, the smell, uh, the taste of something we might have eaten, the sound of the waves, the sound of kids uh, squealing in the background, um, the, the sight of the beautiful blue water. Scenes like that tend to be much more easy to remember than something that happened uh, in the office, <laughs> which is a much more sterile and less uh, uh, sensorially uh, stimulating environment. So uh, multi-sensory experiences are good in helping people hold on to memories. Um, there's another question about what is the role of memory uh, today now that consumers see so much happening online at the same time. So your computer screen is going to be full of ads. Um, how do you break through uh, to make consumers uh, remember your brand or ad? <clears throat> that's, that's like a million dollar question. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, exactly the answer to that, uh, except to say that there are certain things that can do it. As I said, multi-sensory experiences are, are one way to do it, which can be difficult to do, uh, can be difficult to do uh, on the screen, but not entirely. There's been uh, sort of an upswing in uh, so-called auditory branding. Uh, so the, 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 the sounds that we hear frequently associated with brands, like the sound of your Mac starting up or that uh, Intel bong, 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 uh, or uh, a Duracell ad where you hear the sound of like almost like it sounds like a slamming door, boom, at the end of the Duracell ad. Those sorts of auditory cues are one more sense that can be activated and can become linked uh, with a brand over a period of time. Also, if you can activate the hippocampus in somebody's brain, uh, that can work too. So surprise them in some way, either good or bad. Uh, make them uh, think about, think about, uh, surprise them, make them think about something they weren't expected to think about. That uh, activation of the, uh, the hippocampus, uh, either in a positive or negative way, uh, helps people remember things over a period of time. Uh, a question about uh, screening criteria and self-reported behavior, uh, which is a good one because in research we always, um, we often are asking people to, you know, how many times have you purchased X, Y, or Z? And we're, we're using that as criteria for the participants that we're trying to find. I guess it depends. If we're just looking for a ballpark number, um, probably just asking people how often have you purchased brand X in the last year, um, you know, that maybe that's good enough uh, if it's not that important of a question. But if it is a really important question, you probably want to get very specific. So first of all, narrow the time frame. Uh, how often have you bought this brand in the past week or in the past month, if it's a, depending on how frequently people buy that particular product. So make the time window as narrow as possible. Um, or try to get people to, to track it in some way. Um, you can do that with a diary. It's not 100% accurate, but it'll get you there if it's a, something that you would consume uh, multiple times over the course of a week. Um, as I said, if it's possible to sort of get people in, in real time, uh, that may not be uh, cost effective necessarily for screening. Uh, but I would say the two biggest thing would be narrow the time window, provide some context too. Like I said, if it's a study about, um, I don't know, beer, how many times do you drink beer uh, during a typical moment when you're relaxing on the weekend? Um, shorten the time window and give them some context around that consumption situation that you're uh, looking to, to learn about. Um, yeah, there was a comment uh, from Emma about the Pizza Hut UK study. Oh, from one of the people who led that project. Uh, interesting. Uh, uh, from Emma at uh, our friends at BDRC. Uh, yeah, that was, it's sort of become a, a landmark study in uh, 
market research circle. So uh, Emma, very nice to see you joining us today. Um, and then uh, somebody made a comment that uh, when thinking of the Apple logo, I saw the rainbow in my mind. Yeah, that's another thing, the, uh, the, the multicolored Apple logo. So our memories of things from long, long ago can color the things, uh, color our memories of things that are, are much more recent. So those kinds of things can be very difficult to navigate. Are there any other questions? I'll give folks another seven or 10 seconds to start typing something in the chat window if anyone has anything to say or to ask. See a couple of folks typing, so we'll give it a couple of more moments here. Thank you, Emma. The question, will be you be recording and sharing a link? Yes, we will do that. Um, what do you think is the appropriate number of exposures to ensure memory without harming emotional intensity? Uh, great question, and uh, I will be honest, I don't know. I'm sure there's been research done about that. Uh, I can actually check on that rather than sort of give you an off the top of the head answer that may or may not be accurate. Um, uh, I can I can do some poking around on that question and try to get back to to you on that. Um, how do we ensure that our own memories don't interfere with the research? Yeah, that's a good question too, um, because that we always fall well we don't always fall prey to it, but we're always at risk of falling prey to it. Um, you know, we do you'll do research and you'll come out of that research with a predetermined idea of of what respondents told you or what you think you heard. Uh, and then you'll go back to the transcript and you'll say, hmm, not as many people said that as I thought. Uh, so that's a very difficult question. Uh, one way to do it is to get multiple minds on a project. Uh, it's something we always try to do. Uh, get two or three people who have not only uh, done the, the interviews with consumers, but who also have read the transcripts. So uh, if, if you get multiple people involved in the analysis process, you are much less likely to, to fall prey to your own memory uh, leading you astray. Uh, so th that's, that's one of the things that we try to do, plus just advising people to keep an open mind. But that, sometimes that can only go so far. Uh, you really need to get more than one person uh, involved in that process and have a, get a very spirited debate going about what some of the insights were that you heard. I'll give another uh, few seconds here to see if there are any concluding questions. <clears throat> I see there are a couple of people talking. A thank you, a thank you. And one final question, how to keep the brand fresh and at the same time, not make its identity vanish if you wanna try different advertising techniques. Uh, that is a common challenge. Um, you have to keep, I'm trying to think uh, of an example of this uh, off the top of my head, um, but a key would be, I think, to keep, um, keep some element uh, of that older communication alive. Um, yeah, uh, Chandradeep said the absolute bottle. That's one particular thing. The shape of that bottle uh, has been uh, kind of consistent over time throughout a number of different uh, advertising campaigns and the way they use it uh, has been consistent. Uh, in the United States, uh, Progressive Insurance has a very iconic character named Flo. Uh, and Flo was originally uh, portrayed as a character in a store where people were shopping for insurance. Uh, and she was sort of this crazy, loony, fictitious character in a store. Um, over time, that storyline got stale, so they did different things. They moved her out into the real world where she's in people's homes or in people's driveways, or they brought uh, different characters who were dressed similarly uh, 
into that campaign. So it kind of retained her uh, particular image, uh, but just kind of evolved that storyline uh, in a kind of way. So uh, the key there would be, uh, or Corona does something similar. You know, for years they had the campaign of the two people sitting in uh, Adirondack chairs on a beach. And that was basically the entire ad. They have evolved that over time, uh, but the the icon, the metaphor of the beach is still prominent in Corona's communication. Uh, so just keeping something that people remember, especially if it's a, a strong, powerful cue that they associate with the brand, uh, can be really powerful even as you evolve that campaign or those campaigns in different directions. So thank you very much for attending this webinar on memory. Please remember to follow us on Twitter at OlsonZaltman.com, at uh, Twitter at Olson Zaltman. We post all kinds of cool content about not just marketing and not just research, but also uh, emerging research into how people think and make decisions. Our next webinar will be coming up in late May, early June. We're still finalizing the details of that. We will send you an announcement uh, in your inbox once we get that finalized. Also, we'll be posting that news on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on our website at OlsonZaltman.com. Thank you very much for your time today.